Well, good morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. Good. 
good. We're going to start off our worship with wonderful grace of Jesus. If you'll please stand.
you'd help us, Lord. Help us to put aside all those distractions. Help us to put aside, Father, all those things, Lord, that get in our way of seeing you today. And help us to fix our eyes on the perfecter of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome here. If you're here, if you're here for the first time, you should have got a bulletin when you came in. On top of that, you should have got a gift bag uh, as our welcome guest. Also in the bulletin, there's a little tag on there. To, uh, so I, I flipped the hand because it's got two sides. So y'all, have to, so if you if you're one of our first time guests today, please fill one of those out so we have a record of your visit with us today. We're glad that you're here. I wanted to share a couple of things. First of all, um, if you look in front of me, you'll see that the pew racks uh, where, where our Bibles and hymnals are, they're all full now, thanks to the generosity and, and our Adopt a Pew program which literally lasted one week. <laughs> every single pew was adopted, and we now have hymnals in every pew. And so God is good. We were able to update every single one of them, and it's not it's nothing that uh, anybody did other than your faithfulness to the Lord, and God is good through that, and I appreciate that. Thank you for your faithfulness. And so God is good all the time. All, all, the, time. all the time, God, God is, is good. good. Uh, one, one correction in the bulletin. I want to make a note. Uh, this Friday's Bible study uh, as we learn about creation, and we are canceling it for this Friday because, frankly, I won't be in town to leave that, and so we're postponing it to the following Friday. So all those that's in that Bible study on Friday, please make a note to yourself that uh, we're going to be meeting a week from Friday. We're going to be looking at the Ice Age, and so uh, pay attention to that. If you've never come to one of our Friday Bible studies, uh, you're more than welcome to come. We're learning right now about God's creation, so I want to make a point of sharing that. At the conclusion of our service, we are celebrating and observing the Lord's Supper. When you came in, you should have received uh, a, a little cup that's uh, got a wafer on top. You might not recognize that wafer. It's there. You're going to have to peel it back. Uh, and so at the conclusion of our service, we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. So if you fail to get one of those on your way in, feel free sometime during service to, to avail yourself of that. Uh, we need to celebrate and observe the Lord's Supper because Scripture tells us to. Amen? Plus, the, the, the sacrifice of Christ. It's so important. We can't forget. Can't forget what he did on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, Ms. Lisa? Today's scripture reading. Today's scripture reading is John 15, 14 through 16. The Lord said, You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, for I chose each of you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give to you the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Say 
as the ushers come forward for the offering, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for that redemption. Father, because you redeemed us. Father, you purchased us. You bought us with your blood, the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, today we're grateful. We're so grateful, Lord, for that redemption and enabling us, Father, to be a part of your family. So, Father, we take some time now, Lord, as we worship through song. Father, we now worship through our giving. And I pray today, Father, that you will, Lord, bless what is given. Father, bless the giver. And, Father God, that you will multiply everything that is given, Father, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, so others will know who Jesus is. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Good morning. And uh, good to be back in the pulpit. Uh, it was good to have Brother Marty in here with us last week. I hope that you were here to be able to uh, to hear uh, Brother Marty speak. And that was a great message out of out of John chapter 14. But it's good to be back. Um, I like uh, I like hearing other preachers, but uh, when the preachers aren't in the pulpit for a while, they miss it. And I can tell you that would be me. And so uh, we're going to be in, we're starting a new sermon series today out of First Peter. So we're going to be in First Peter for about seven, eight weeks. And so uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 today, if you'd like to find your place there. Chapter 1 of First Peter, verses 1 and 2. And so while you're finding your place there, I want to, I guess, do a little housekeeping. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, he doesn't know to say this, but in a couple of weeks, um, the, the young man who's been running our our camera for our live stream service is, is transitioning to another ministry. Uh, Bo's in the back. He's the one who wears the flower shirt all the time. And uh, he's, he's been helping us for quite a while, but he's having to transition. So in case you don't know, we live stream our services. Uh, every, we have a camera right on the back wall underneath our screen. And so uh, everything we do is being broadcast on our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and eventually ends up on our Rumble page. And so uh, the reason why I say this is that we're going to be looking for somebody to run our camera. Uh, and so uh, it's all on a computer program. And so um, pray about that, uh, that God will bring us somebody that can, that can run this, uh, this system for us. It's very important that we stay uh, on the web. And so uh, if you, you, or know, you know somebody that would be willing to help out and, and run our camera, it's a very simple process, but you need somebody to do it. It, does, it doesn't run on autopilot. And so uh, if you know somebody that uh, can help out with that or... If you just want to pray about it, please do. Just uh, lift that up to, as a matter of prayer. Uh, we do want to thank Bo uh, for everything he's done. Bo has put a lot of work into this church, helping us uh, with our cameras, uh, helping us with all kinds of technology issues. Our uh, choir microphones work now, and they weren't working forever. And uh, we've transitioned a lot uh, since he's been here. And I just want to say thank you to Bo for everything he's done. Uh, he's, been, he's done a great job. We appreciate you, sir. And I know he doesn't want any attention, but I'm giving it to him anyway, uh, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, encouragement is a great thing, and that's scriptural. And so thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So make that a matter of prayer um, as, you, uh, as you have your prayer time each day. All right. Hopefully you found your place in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, it's in the back of the bulletin if you'd like to use that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and a temporary residence of dispersion, and to the, in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and set apart by the Spirit for obedience and for the sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Father God, as we begin this time together, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you would hide me behind your cross. Father, I wouldn't say anything that doesn't come from you. Father, this message, Lord, your word, as, as Barry Song says, the word of God speaks, Father, that's what I want. To be heard today, not me. So, Father, I pray today, Lord, that you will speak. And, Father, that you will give us ears to hear and ears to listen to what you have to say. Father, I pray that you would draw us to yourself. And, Father, may we leave here today, Father, we'll know that we would be, have been with the living God. Father, that is my prayer. And, Father, we turn this time over to you, Father, because this, this is your church. This is your people. This is your house. Father, we surrender all to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of y'all remember back to your school days? I know some of y'all going way back, but go back to your school days where you had your favorite activity in school was, get it, recess, right? How many of y'all remember recess? Now, they still do recess in elementary schools, I think. They took it for some reason, some school districts took recess away for a long time, and I thought that was just horrible. Kids need to be able to stretch their legs. But anyway, y'all remember recess, right? And recess, basically, you just go out to the playground, you go out and do something, right? And y'all remember, y'all remember, I don't know about, if you, all the girls did this, maybe they did this or not, but I know with the guys, we always like try to get a little pick-up football game for like 30 minutes, and we all, we all decide, okay, we got to get teams, we get, we get to pick two kids, had to pick teams, and then basically everybody wanted to be on so-and-so's team, right? So what happened? Everybody put their hands up, right? They put their hands up, pick me, pick me, right? Pick me. And, and, and maybe you were like me, I was standing there with my hands the whole time, I never got picked. The only time I ever got picked was, well, we got to have the teams that are even, right? Teams got to be even. I was never, I was never the one that was in athletic at the time in elementary school. I was never picked. I was always assigned. 
Well, you get to be on Sozo's team because if not, there's not the teams are not even well. Somebody's got somebody's got to fill that spot, so we need a warm body. The kids never said that, but that's what it felt like. It felt horrible. Maybe that was you growing up. I don't know. Maybe you were the ones that got to pick people. I don't know. But it feels good to be picked, right? Not to be assigned like, well, I guess you get to play because we got to have an even team, right? No, that doesn't feel good. What feels good is somebody said, and not only get picked, but you get to be the first one picked. Yeah. And they say, and they point right at you and they say, I want so and so on my team, right? You remember that? And then that, if that was you, you know what it feels like to get picked. You're like, oh, that's right, I'm picked. Yes, right? This is awesome. You know, and so when you get when you get picked, it's a good feeling. And so today we're talking about that feeling of getting picked because I'm gonna hear I'm here to tell you, if you're if you're a child of God, you have been picked. Okay? You and here's the thing, you probably didn't even have your hand up. You probably weren't even looking to be on the team. You probably weren't even looking for him, but God and his sovereignty pursued you and said, I want you and you and you to be a part of my family. And it doesn't feel awesome to be picked by God. That he sees the, it's not that, we don't have to see the value in ourselves, but he sees the value in us, Right? And, and, and he's like, well, you know, we might think, well, I'm not worthy to be picked. I'm not worthy. You know, I, you know, it's just like for playing sports. Like, I can't play baseball. I can't swing. I can't catch. But, but somebody said, you know what? I want you on the team anyway. It's like, I can't even play this game, and I'm still getting picked. What's that mean, right? It means that they think a lot of you. And so today I want you to think about that how God picked you. And if you're a child of God and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you, my friend, have been picked. I don't know about you, but that should make you feel good. That should give you chill bumps. That the creator of the universe, the one who spoke everything to existence, at some point in your history, he came to you and he said, I want you. Is that, that mind-blowing or what? Because in all honesty, I still wonder why he picked me. I still wonder why he picked me because I ain't nobody special. But he said, you know what? I want you to be in my family. And he pursued me. And, and if you know Jesus Christ, you know he's pursued you. Some of y'all, he pursued you for a long period of time, right? Because he chased you down and you didn't want nothing to do with it. You're like, you know, you made excuses about why you didn't want to be on God's team. You didn't want to be on God's team. You just kept making excuses. I'm not good enough. I can't do this. It's impossible. I'm really not sure I want to do this. I'm not sure I can make the commitment. But God just kept pursuing until one day you said yes. I will be on that team. And you chose Jesus, right? To be on that team. Isn't that a blessing? If you, if you, if you know Jesus Christ, you have been chosen. Today we're, we're beginning the series of 1 Peter. And Peter here is he's, he's writing as he introducing here. He introduces himself. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. That means that he was with Jesus. Okay? He was with Jesus. And then it tells us who he's writing to. He says to the temporary residents, some translations say aliens, of the dispersion. He gives a list of places, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. These were all places in what's known as Asia Minor, okay? And so he's, like, these are all recipients. He says these are the temporary residents, okay? Basically, this is Peter. Peter, look what he says here in verse 1. So we get ready to get cranked up here. He says, I'm right into the temporary residence of the dispersion. Dispersion basically meant that the Christians, uh, our Christian faith began in Jerusalem, where, where Christ was crucified and Christ rose again, and, and then the church started in Jerusalem, and then, and then persecution came, and the persecution, what? Dispersed the church. The church was dispersed. And all through the book of Acts, if you read the book of Acts, which is a, a book about church history, it explains where the church began in that upper room of Pentecost, and it exploded all the way to the end of Acts where we find the Apostle Paul in Rome. The, the gospel spread over the entire Roman Empire in a, in a mere short period of time. How is that possible? God does that. But Peter here, he says, I'm writing to the temporary residents, the aliens of the dispersion. He's writing to believers. This letter is writing. He's not just writing to believers. He's writing to 
persecuted believers. As we go through 1 Peter, you see uh, these believers are being persecuted for their faith. They're being ridiculed for their faith. It took a lot of guts to be a Christian in this, the time of this writing. In Bible times, it took a lot to say yes to Jesus. Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's a lot easier today, culturally, to say yes to Jesus. Because if you say yes to Jesus today, what's going to happen to you? Is somebody going to come knock on your door? Hey, I heard you trusted Jesus. I'm here to carry you away. Does that happen here? Not yet. Happens other places around the world. Yeah, it does. I just read a story this week about a number of churches in Nigeria, Baptist churches, that were burned down by, by Islamists, uh, militants. Burned down. But it doesn't happen here. But see, we don't get persecuted. They don't come knocking on our door. You don't get people that, that comes up to you at Walmart and starts you know, beating you with a baseball bat because you trust in Jesus. That doesn't happen, does it? At least I don't know about it. But these believers were persecuted. They were persecuted. They said yes to Jesus, knowing they were going to get heat for it. And they did it anyway. And he's writing this letter to them to encourage them. Hey, hang in there. And this letter is a letter of encouragement. Joy, this is a journey. The Christian life is a journey. You, the starting point is your salvation. And then you take a journey with Jesus. Think about that. You're taking a journey like a walk through the woods on a path with Jesus. And the journey never ends. All it does is that when you die, you, your journey all of a sudden takes on a huge difference. Now you're literally walking with the Savior. And the journey is no longer as hard as it was because you're now with Jesus. You see, Peter's writing to the believers say, I want you to have joy in this journey. Have joy because what did Jesus say? I came to give you what? I came to give you peace. I came to give you joy. I came. When you know Jesus, you know what peace is all about, right? And when you know Jesus, you know that, that joy is not something that's temporary. Joy is not happiness, people. Happiness is when your spouse buys you the Mercedes C's class for your birthday. That's happiness because you're like, cool, Mercedes C's class, hope it's red. On my birthday, right? That's happiness. But eventually, that's going to go away. It's like a roller coaster. Happiness, and you don't think happiness goes away? Look at, look at your kids or your grandkids five days after Christmas and see if they're not already working up that next list and already dissatisfied with what they already have. Amen? They're happy on Christmas Day, but five days later. Yeah, but I wanted it. You know what I'm talking about? He wasn't that joy. Joy can be had even if there's no happiness. It's weird, but it is true. And that only happens to Jesus. And here, Peter's writing to the temporary residents, aliens. Basically, this is to boil it down. This is the letter from the homeless to the homeless. Because if you're because, because if you know Jesus, you are homeless. You're like, wait, does my brother my house down while I'm here at church? No. If you know Jesus, this world is not your home. You should not be getting comfortable here. And this should, you shouldn't be putting all your marbles in the basket of this being your home because I got news for you. This is a very short period of time compared to eternity. This is not your home. This world's not your home. Wherever your house is, wherever you reside, wherever you put your feet up in the chair, you know, that is a residence, but it's temporary. Jesus, the, the, the last week Marty mentioned about John 14 where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's prepared a place for us. For those who have accepted Christ as Lord, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a place with our name on it that he's made just for us. Isn't that all? And it's, here's the thing. We can't be all caught up in everything being perfect here. So this is a letter. Peter's homeless. Okay. To the homeless. And so we're all aliens. If that's what that's it talks about, that temporary residence or aliens. You know what an alien is, right? I'm not, talk, not talking about Mars. I'm talking about somebody who's living somewhere that doesn't belong. Okay? They're, they're, they, they, they're, they're foreigners. And here he says, to the temporary residence. Folks, we're just passing through. Let me encourage you with that. So if you're going through some stuff today, just know. This just pissed off. You know Jesus, this pissed off. 
This is just a pit stop. You can have bad days, but I got news for you. Eternity is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Let's take a look here at the passage here. In verse 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 2, actually, in the beginning, at the end of verse 1, he says, To the residents of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Benedictine, there's that word, chosen. I love it. Chosen. First thing I want you to see is that we are chosen by God's foreknowledge. How do I know that? It says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We did not choose him. He chose us. Nobody here today could give a testimony about their faith in Christ. Well, they said, you know what? I woke up on March 19th, 1973, and I just said, you know what? I'm going to be a Christian. That's nobody's testimony because nobody does that. It doesn't work that way. Nobody, just, nobody decides to, you know, pull out their phone and pull out their, you know, their, their shopping list and, or their to-do list and say, you know what? Tomorrow I need to trust Jesus. Let me put that in there. Nobody does that because you can't do that. You don't get. Nobody gets saved that way. Nobody comes to Christ that way. You, the salvation only happens when God draws you to Himself. He chose you, and when He chose you, the Father pursues you. It says, according to the foreknowledge of God. You see, the thing is that he chose us, you and me, that know Christ, before time began, before creation. In other words, he knew you were going to be in his family before Genesis 1-1. Is that mind blowing or what? He knew you were going to be a part of his family before Genesis 1-1, before he said, in the beginning. And that, that's, that's, just, that's just my mind. That doesn't mean that your salvation is guaranteed in the sense that, that there was nothing you could do to not be saved. That doesn't mean that you were going to be saved no matter what. That means that God knew you were going to be a part of his family. In his sovereignty, he knew you were going to be his. Think about that. He knew. He foreknew that you were going to be in his family. He knew you were going to be the family before you knew you were going to be the family. Isn't that cool? He knew you were going to be part of the family before you recognized it. He pursued you. In God's sovereignty, he chose to deliver the gospel to us. Who did God use to deliver the gospel to you? You can probably, you might even be able to name names. I can tell you the name of a guy right now. Nine-year-old boy. Music minister. The guy's name was Rick Booze. Yep, just how it sounds. Like the drink, Booze. Music minister. Red-headed college kid in my dad's church. I say college kid. He was an adult to me, but he was a college kid. Drove a really nice Camaro. But he, he, he shared the gospel with me on Wednesday night. When I sat in my dad's church, my dad wasn't even there. He was working. He was bivocational. And I sat on a second or third pew on the right-hand side, those old, stinking, smelly, woody pews of that church in the hills of Tennessee, and, and, and God clearly said, son, you don't belong to me. And I thought I was pissed up because my dad was a preacher and I was going to church. I sang in church, and you know, I dressed up as Moses on Halloween. I think I was good. I thought I had my salvation taken care of. God clearly said, no, you don't belong to me, and that scared me to death. And I got a hold of, I got a hold of Rick afterwards, and I just said, I can't leave. I was in tears. I said, I can't do this. I said, you cannot leave. So I, I got to get this straight because this ain't right. And I told him what my story was. He said, let's nail it down. And we nailed it down, and the rest is history. You see, God used him to bring me the gospel. He chose me. To be in his family. And he used Rick to do it. You probably know the person that did that for you. You ought to be grateful for that person. That they were obedient to share the gospel with you. You see, nobody gets saved without the Holy Spirit prompting conviction of sin. You don't just decide one day to get saved. The Holy Spirit has to draw you. The Holy Spirit has to, has to tell you that, first of all, you can't do this by yourself. You can't do life without. You can't do life by yourself. Number two, there's no way you can get to heaven without, without help. Number three, you know what that help is? Jesus. Jesus came to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He paid the penalty of sin, so you wouldn't have to. You see? And then, when the next thing he does is that he helps us to see that, guess what? Like Romans says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's right. We're all sinners. Everybody in this place is a sinner. I hope that's not a new splash for you. Okay? But we're all sinners. Some of us are just sinners saved by grace. Amen? And so the reality is, is that when you know, the Holy Spirit draws us, he draws us and helps us to see that we 
can't do life without him. So you have to ask this question. Why would God choose you? Why would God choose you? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. You might be thinking, well, I'm not really loved. Matter of fact, I'm kind of mean and cranky. Hopefully that's not you, but it doesn't really matter. Does that mean that God, can God still love people like that? God loves everybody. He loves everybody. And it's not a, it's not a, I love you like I love a slice of pizza. It's a, I love you, and it comes all the way to the depths of my heart. Okay, that's how much he loves you. He chose us because he loves us. And you know the good thing about this? Is that God's always added to his family. He's always added to his family. So you might be thinking, you know, why would he choose me? Because he absolutely adores you. Why would God even choose his disciples? Look at Peter, that God, that God used to, 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 to write down his word. Peter was a fisherman who had a mouth of a fisherman to prove it. You know anything about Peter? He was a he, he, he was a he was a redneck fisherman from Galilee. And he, he often ran his mouth. Scripture proves that. And God used him to share the gospel. God used him to be a part of his family. Andrew, his brother, was also a fisherman. James and John. Jesus actually called James and John the sons of thunder. And I got, I will tell you, it wasn't a compliment. It wasn't a compliment. He calls them the sons of thunder. You know, you see Matthew. Matthew, a disciple. He was a hated tax collector. And everybody hated tax collectors. But Matthew said yes to Jesus. And Jesus said, come on, man. I'll take you too. He took, basically Matthew was the ugly, the ugly little tiny kid that was at recess that nobody ever picked. He, he was the one that was picked. He said, come on, Matthew, you be on my team. Come on, you be on my team. Me? You, yeah. Remember, y'all remember the calling of Matthew? Where was Matthew when, God, when, when Jesus said, follow me? Where was he at? Sitting in his tax collector office, taking money from the Jews and taking more than he should have. Because that's what they did. Okay? So Jesus walks up to his walks up to his booth and says, Hey, Matthew, come follow me. What? You know what the Bible says he did? He got up and he followed. Him. Can you imagine all the other disciples? Jesus, are like, are you really rational picking the tax collector to be a part of the uh, of this group here? You really gonna pick one of them nasty sinners? Yep, he's mine. Thomas. He's known as the doubter, but basically he was the pessimist of the group. He was the one that basically at some point, God, Jesus, all we got is two loaves and a few fish here. Hey, we can't feed all these people with this. And Jesus said, yeah, hold my cane. <laughs> and holds up the basket and boom, all we got all this, like, fed 5,000 men. Not that he kept the kids, kids and women. All right? Then Thomas was the one to like, how are we going to do this? He was the logical one of the group. And, and Jesus picked him. He, he would pick a guy named, he's saying Simon the Zealot. Simon, you know what a zealot was? He was a political activist who was sought out by the Romans. Because, you know, and, and, and these political activists in, in Jesus' time, they hated Romans. They looked for opportunities to kill Romans. He chose a political activist to be a part of his disciple group. Go figure, right? <laughs> he chose Simon the Zealot. And who can bet? Who, who can look at Judas? Judas is scary. Why would he choose Judas, knowing he was going to betray him? Why? He chose to be part of Judas' wife, you'll tell him. Now, Judas didn't, didn't recognize that love. It's evident from Scripture. Judas turned his back and rejected that love. But Jesus loved him. He loved him. See, God chose us to be a part of his family. It doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter where you've been, how far away from God you've strayed. He chose us and he loves us. And that makes you special. Doesn't it? But look at what it continues to say in verse 2. Not just the foreknowledge of God the Father, but set apart by the Spirit for obedience. We're not just chosen by God's foreknowledge, we're also set apart by the Spirit. Do you know, as a child of God, the Holy Spirit indwells you? When you became a child of God, God, the, God and the person of the Holy Spirit came and literally took up residence in your life. He literally came and, hey, it's Holy Spirit! I'm here to hang out for you for with, with you for eternity. Because the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells every believer, and he stays there until we get to heaven. Isn't that amazing? He, he, he comes alongside. Because you know what? The journey, the journey, the journey for Christ is not really easy. 
Matter of fact, it's impossible. You can't do it. I can't do it. But the Holy Spirit's like, you know what? Dude, this is a real hard trip. You need a guide. You need a guide to get you through this journey. And guess what? I'm just a guy that can do it. That's the Holy Spirit. He's the guy. So the Holy Spirit comes, and he says he's set apart by the Spirit for obedience. What does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the believer? There's this big $5 word called sanctification. You know what that word means? So the process of making one holy. Because when you become a child of God, guess what you are? You're a baby. <laughs> Think of a baby, a little baby, baby, you know, six months old. What, what can a baby do? What does babies, what does six months old baby, what are they good at? Crying, pooping, and eating. I mean, come on. Is there anything else they're good at? Well, maybe making faces for, you know, YouTube videos or whatever. You know, but honestly, other than that, what are they good for? That's about it, right? They really can't do, babies can't do much, right? But babies grow, right? And eventually they start walking. That's when you got to start walking the cabins, right? They start walking and they start learning. They start getting into stuff, right? The terrible twos, uh huh, right? See, babies have to grow. And as a Christian, you can't stay a baby. You've got to grow in your faith. And the Holy Spirit is the one that helps you to go from being a spiritual baby to becoming a mature believer. That's his job to help you do that. And he is along for the ride to help make sure that happens. He wants us to be more and more and more and more like Christ. Now, that being said, when he gives guidance on our life, when he tells us how to live our life to be more like Christ, can we say no? Yeah, we can say no. Many of us do. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Yeah, I think I do it my own way. And then we find out later that wasn't the right way, right? You see, the Holy Spirit will guide us, and the Holy Spirit will put the arm and say, you need to do this. Sometimes we have to do things our own way. But the Holy Spirit will guide us if we will just listen, we, to make us more like Jesus Christ. Here's the reality of this. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Does that, does that, does that make sense? We live here, but we're not of here. And to kind of put it in a, in a term that I've used before, it's like a square peg in a round wall. That would be me. And that was me before I became a Christian. <laughs> I've always been a square peg. At least I can tell you. But as a Christian, you are the spiritual round peg and a, a square peg in a round wall. Because you will never, ever fit perfectly into what's out there. Because what's out there is not, it's not godly. This world is controlled by what? It's the Satanism. He's, he's the ruler of the ruler of everything. Jesus acknowledges it. He's the one that's in charge of everything. So we're, the, the, the culture and everything that ties into it, everything all follows. It goes from from a place of darkness. We will never fit as a child of God into that. We should never ever be comfortable in that. Does that make sense? You should never be comfortable where you're at in this world. You should always have a longing for home. Anybody here homesick? Anybody here looking for looking to go home? I mean, I hope that you're ready. I hope that you're ready. You should always be looking to go home. You see, the thing is, is that when you trust in Christ, you change teams. You change allegiances. You went from Satan's team to Jesus' team. And guess what that did to you? That put a target on your back. Anybody that's ever told you that the Christian life is a bed of roses and that everything gets perfect, when you just trust Christ, everything gets good, happiness comes, you get, you know, God blesses you with great health and money and cars and boats and all that, and everything's just wonderful. Anybody ever tells you that, they're lying to you, because that's not scripture. Matter of fact, scripture says, if Jesus himself says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. <laughs> if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. So trusting Jesus, it doesn't mean that your life is not going to be perfect. Life's going to be hard, but you're not doing it by yourself because guess what? You now have a you now have God Himself guiding you through it to navigate through it. You don't do this by yourself anymore. The Holy Spirit does that for you. It talks about the obedience of the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit guides us in God's ways, helps us to stay on the path we're called to. He prompts us to witness, to encourage, to tell others about God. Have you ever been somewhere and all of a sudden you, you heard 
you heard a voice that said, I need you to go talk to so-and-so about Jesus. Have you I'm not talking about an audible voice. But sometimes it comes out like that. Where, where you, you just heard a voice that said, I want you to go talk to them. You ever, has that ever happened to you and you're looking around? No, am I the only one that's ever happened? It happens. The Holy Spirit will encourage us to tell other people about Jesus. Right? Aren't you thankful that somebody was encouraged to tell you about Jesus? And they listened. They were obedient to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompts us to witness, and the Holy Spirit also makes us aware of sin in our lives, helps us to see the sin in our life, that, that we need cleansing. You know, the thing is, is that when it comes to sin, we, we can't fix that problem, can we? We can't fix the problem. But you know what? He can. He can. doesn't matter what's past unconfessed sin or present fixing a happen type sin. That's what he does. The Holy Spirit, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll be somewhere, and the Holy Spirit said, you know what? You don't need to be here. You need to go somewhere else. Get out of here. You ever been somewhere you felt that? Man, I have. Get. God said, go, and you go. Something, something in your spirit just doesn't feel right. I've been there, okay? The Holy Spirit will guide you in that. The Holy Spirit will also say, you know what? You know, you know, before you lie on your taxes, you better, man, you better uh, think about this because that's wrong. You know, like preacher, you preach about taxes. Don't no, preach about lying. Just the sin, lying is sin. And the Bible says, Jesus Himself says that the devil is the father of lies. So when we lie, we act just like the devil. I hope, I hope that's not really calling anybody out, but here's that's that's the scripture. And so the Holy Spirit helps us. To recognize, you know, when we're about to sin, to help us make better choices. You know something about choices? We always have a choice, right? We always have a choice. There's a few choices that, that you think about in history were not really, that could have been better. And this has actually been in the news lately because of what, what they're about to do. In 1985, Coca-Cola decided they were going to change their formula and go with new Coke. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in high school, and they made change, and all of a sudden they called it the new improved coat. And that stuff was nasty. If you've ever had it, if you've never had it, then you can say you felt blessed. That was gross. I, and, and you know what? They got such a backlash that in 79 days, they got rid of the new coat, destroyed the, the new formula, and went back to now they call it classic. Coca-Cola classic, which was the original formula to begin with. They messed with something that was working, tried to make it better. It was a poor choice. Bad business decision, and they suffered for it. Another bad business decision, another bad choice. All I got to do is say one word, Kodak. You ever heard of a Kodak moment? Used to be like, you know, you take a good picture. Well, that's a Kodak moment. You better go take that picture. Younger folks don't know what that is. Kodak. What's Kodak? That, that used to be the biggest photo business, the photo company business in, in the country. You couldn't, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing Kodak. It was everywhere. But Kodak had an opportunity at some point to, to use and change new photo technology. And their, their big bosses said, no, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing because it's working. And what happened? Three years later after that decision, they went bankrupt. Can you find Kodak stuff now? Maybe, but not nearly than what it was. Kodak. And then lastly, y'all probably know, you probably heard about them. Blockbuster video, right? How many of you have ever run a video of a blockbuster? Some of you are like, what's blockbuster? Uh, yeah. At one time, there was over 9,000 blockbuster video stores. There was one right here in Town Hall Square. It's where, the, uh, it's where the Chase Bank is now. <laughs> okay? 9,000 of them. You can go and you go rent a video, or, and then it became DVD, and then you can rent video games or video game players, or you can rent them. Heaven forbid you can rent a VCR. You, if you didn't have one, you could go rent a VCR. Yeah, oh my goodness. Well, here's the thing. There was a point in time in 2004 where the, 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 the corporate bigwigs of a little small company called Netflix came to and said, we'd like to partner with you to do streaming videos. How about that? And you know what they said? Nah, I think we'll pass. They passed. And they shouldn't have. Because y'all know, know what Netflix is now, right? Because they're the streaming giant right now. they everything. And what Blockbuster is, they, they got one store left. It's in Oregon. It's the last holdout. One more. <laughs> they, they, they refused to change. They had an opportunity. They had a choice to listen to the guidance they had, and they, they passed on it, and now they lost out. 
You have an eye, and I have a choice today to listen to the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. It may not be like Coke or, or Kodak or, 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 or video, but it's a lot, it's a lot more important choice. You have a choice today to listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because today I'm here to tell you, He's He's drawing us. He's drawing us. And lastly, you see in verse 2 that we're purchased by and given a purpose by Jesus Christ. Yeah, I might ask you yourself this question. Why did God leave me here on this earth? Why did God leave me here? Why did he leave you here? Why can't he just take me home? There's downs I just wish, God. Why did you just take me home when you saved me? So I'm gonna have to deal with all this stuff down here. That'd be nice, right? All the pain, the pain and aches and, and sin problems and bad relationships and all that stuff, man. You know what? He left us here for a purpose. You know what? You, you know what? You and I were given, when we came to Christ, we were given a God-given purpose. You weren't just saved and bought and chosen. You were given a, you were given what you, what you call the marching orders. Okay? We were given marching orders because when you change teams, all, Jesus assigns uh, uh, your job on the team. Because when you join a team, he doesn't say, okay, you're on a team, great, you're on the bench. Everybody has a job on a team. Am I right? Everybody has a job. And nobody's job is to ride the pine. We all have a job. So why did he leave us here? I got three things for that. Number one, so we can share with others what God did for us. So we can share with others what God did for us. God, can you tell your story? I don't call it testimony. I hate that. Testimony, that's a, that's a, that's a church word. A lot of folks in the culture are like, testimony, that sounds like something important. Because <laughs> it's a legal term. But in reality, it's your story. I, I, when I ask somebody, hey, can I tell you my story? Everybody likes to hear a story, right? Everybody likes to hear a story. So tell my story. This is, this is my story of how I found Jesus, or how Jesus found me. Okay? He left us here so we can share with others what God did for us. He left us here so we can be salt and light in a dark world, not just for not as a Christian witness, but as a Christian lifestyle. He's left us here so we can be salt and light. We talked about that in Matthew 5. He wants us to be salt that preserves and light that shines in a dark world. We ought to be the we gotta be the light bulb in a dark room. And that light that comes from us comes from Jesus. Because we're not the sun, we're the moon, we were blessed. We're not the source. But we gotta be that salt and light. How often are we being that salt and light? I'm not talking about here. This is easy to be salt and light here. It's easy. Because this is a Christian pepper alley. That's all that's what church is. Service, this is pepper alley. You can together go, woo, man! We're all sitting here. We're all worshiping the king. We love Jesus. Yeah, right? It's a pepper alley. But you know what? Pepper alley comes to an end, and we gotta get back to real life, right? Which is out there. At some point, you, you've got to you, you gotta be living what you what you what you're excited about in here. You gotta get excited about it out there. Because if it doesn't leave the room, what good is the pep? The pep's gone, right? There's no more pep. And lastly, he left us here so we can glorify God in our life through our relationships and through 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 missions. One of the main purposes of us being here is to give God glory. We give God glory in our testimony. We give God glory in, 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 in living for him. We give God glory by being everything he's called us to be. Listening and following the obedience of the Holy Spirit. If you listen to what the Holy Spirit says and you obey him, I'm going to tell you, you will give God glory. And you will put a smile on his face. And ain't that what it's about? Don't you want to put a smile on the Father's face where he stands up and he goes, that's my kid. Check it out. Call a bunch of angels over and look at that. That's my kid. You see what they just did? They just encouraged a group of people because of me. Check that out. That's awesome. He said, God does that? Yeah, he does that. He does it all the time. You see, he wants us to be that salt line. He wants us to glorify him. And when we glorify him, Guess what? Other people see who he is. And isn't that what it's all about? Because they didn't come here to see you. What's the, what's the phrase? No, people. Oh, well, that's the main attraction. That's why they came to see. No. When it comes to our faith, they don't come to see us. They don't come to see me. You come to It's about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It always will be about Jesus. It should be. Give him glory. Our given purpose is to give Christ glory. Give God glory through our testimony, through our lifestyle, through relationships. Here's the thing we wrap this up. Peter is encouraging the believers, and the first thing he does before he gets to anything else is he says, I want you to know that God says you're special, and God thinks the world of you. 
And if you're here today and you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you know you're special. Maybe some of us here need a reminder. You know, sometimes we, you know, we don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit like we're supposed to. Sometimes we, you know, we make poor choices in life. <laughs> Amen. And the Holy Spirit's like, man, you had, you could have done this, but you did that. But you know, the cool thing is that we can always first John one night, which is what that, what does that say? He is. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. In other words, when we mess up, he's ready. He's right there to clean us up if we just bring it to him. Every single time. He'll clean us up if we bring it to him. That's the cool thing about it. And so he chose us long before time began. And he chose us to be his child here so that other people will know just how awesome he is. Is God awesome? Do other people see his awesomeness in our life? That's the question we all got to ask. Do other people see his awesomeness? Because if they don't see his awesomeness, something's wrong somewhere. Okay? But I want you to walk out of here here understanding that he chose you. If you're not, if you're here today and you don't know him, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You walked in today and you, you've heard about him, but you've never said yes to Jesus. I don't know who you are. Only God knows that. But I'm here to tell you, that's you today. I want you to know, first of all, that God loves you. Whether you're here in this building, whether you're, on, whether you're watching this live stream, I'm going to tell you, God loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to be a part of his family. And all you got to do is say, yes, I trust him. He's the one that can take care of my sin problem. He's the one that can, he can, he can, he can give me eternal life. He's the one that can give me everything I need to have a joy-filled life. Not happiness. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, you do not have a relationship with him, please, I'm just encouraging you, please do not walk out. Do not leave until you settle that. Be like, when I was a nine-year-old boy, I would not let Rick leave. I, would, I said, you can't leave until, until I get this straight. Uh, we got to get it nailed down. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're just like, you know what, I cannot leave this building until I get this nailed down. Maybe that's you. you got to nail it down. Maybe he said something to you today about that. Maybe he said, you know what? I want you in the family, but you're not part of my family yet. But you know what? All it takes is you to say, yes, amen. Because he loves you. Amen? He loves you more than you know. He loves you more than anybody else. And he loves you despite you. Because <laughs> he knows how bad and how evil we can be, and he still loves us. Isn't that cool? That's the cool thing. He knows we're going to screw up, and he says, that's all right. I love him anyway. I love him anyway, because that's my kid. Amen? Today, say yes to Jesus if you don't know him. And if you do know him, I want you to, just, I want you to recognize that how special you are in his sight. Amen? You are special. Father, I, I, today as we looked at this passage here, and Peter, Lord, Peter begins this letter, Lord, he starts right off saying, I want you to know how special you are. You're chosen. One of the first verbs there in that verse is that. It says chosen. We're chosen. How special is that, Lord? Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for making part, me a part of your family. Lord, I didn't deserve any of that. But, Father, it's not about us deserving. It's about the grace of God. Father, that's why we sang these grace songs today, Father, because it's all about the grace. Father, because you have just bestowed your grace upon us and allowed us to be in your family through what Jesus did on the cross. Father, there's somebody here today. Lord, you, you're drawn. They know it but they haven't said yes to you yet. Lord, I pray today they will not walk out of here. Father, they will not let the sun go down until they do business with you, until they recognize that, that they need you. Father, I pray today, Lord, that they will say yes to you. Father, today, if we come in here and we carry a bunch of birds, and we've, we've been, that, that journey has been rough lately, Lord, I pray today that we've been reminded that, that we have a walking partner. we got a guide on our path, and that's you. You're walking that path with us. Help us to be more mindful of that today, that you are walking with us. Father, as we go into this decision time, Lord, I pray today, any decisions that need to be made, Father, I pray that you will not let it go by, Lord, that uh, you will encourage the folks, Lord, to do what you've called them to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen. If you please stand.
seek me out, Lord, so that I can help them, Lord, to find you, Father, just like you found me many, many years ago. Father God, we may have just sang a short song, Father, but Lord, the time of your calling, Father, is still here. So, Father, I pray today, if you're, if you're calling, and you're, and you're leading, and you're encouraging others, Lord, to, to do something, Lord, I pray they will not leave until they do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we're going to uh, read a passage about the uh, Lord's Supper out of 1 Corinthians. And scriptures tell us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that Christians are to do this regularly. Okay, There's never a time, there's never a day. Some churches do it monthly, some do it quarterly, some do it twice a year. It, really, it, it doesn't matter. What the scripture says is that you do it and that you do it regularly. And so that's why we're here. Okay, And so the elements that are before you, if, again, if you didn't grab elements on your way in. I trust that you can go back and do that. Well, today, let me look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 20, beginning verses 23. This is, this is Jesus speaking. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul is quoting, this is, For I received the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took the bread, and this is the bread, and he gave thanks, and he, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He continues here, and he's, and he's speaking, Paul is speaking here and talking about the cup. He says here, in verse 25, he says in the same way, he says in the same way he took the cup after supper because they had a meal and he said this cup is the new covenant. The new covenant now the covenant is another word for testament so we have in the Bible we have Old Testament and New Testament so another word for that would be Old Covenant, New Covenant because that's what it is. The Old Testament is the Old Covenant, the law. The New Testament is the New Covenant Jesus Christ. You see, So it says this cup is the New Covenant in my blood. The blood makes it possible. He says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He says in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Folks, I'm here to tell you, without the Sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, there would be no reason for us to be here. We could be on the beach. We could be watching TV. We could be mowing our grass. Anything else would make sense. But the sacrifice of Jesus is why we're here. Jesus' death and resurrection is, was, the, was the game changer, was the life changer. And that's why we're here. Amen? And so th these elements represent the, blood, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that was broken and was spilled on our behalf. <laughs> Now, scriptures say, not here in 1 Corinthians, scriptures say that when they were in the upper room and they celebrated the first Lord's Supper with Christ, that they ended it with a song. And that's what we're about to do. We're going to end it with a song. And so it's a short little course. You may know it's going to be on the screen. And so I want everybody to stand. This is, the, this is going to be our close. When the song is over, you'll be dismissed. There is no closing prayer. And this is in lieu of it. So we're going to close. Just like they did in the upper room, we're going to close with this song. Called the family of God. Miss Lisa, you want to help lead us?
Thank you.